Okay. Circular dynamics. We got two more problems that we need to do. So the one that we're going to be dealing with this time is a jet. And oop, that is a highlighter. Hang on. We're going to try again. You want a rainbow jet? Okay, so uh, jet. There you go. It's got like wings and stuff. All right, we're going to go in a circle. This is going to be a vertical circle. So we're going to be going up and around like this. Okay, we're going to be going around in a vertical circle. So this way is going to be going straight up. Okay. So we're going to try to talk about the forces acting on a person as it goes around the loop itself. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? So there is a person in this uh, airplane. So the person in the airplane, as they're going around, will feel forces depending on where they actually are in the circle itself. Okay. So as they go around, they're going to move, and then they're going to go up to the very, very top position. This is the first place that we want to actually look at the forces. So I'm going to call this position A. Okay. Now, at position A, what forces do I have acting on the person? Just pretend that this, pretend that this dot is a person. Okay. You have gravity. And what? Uh, what do you mean? Right. So, well, we're in a we're in a circle, right? So gravity. I think we can say that it's fair to say that gravity is pulling down, right? So if the person has a mass m, so we'll just say that this person's mass is m. We can also say that there is a uh, mg force acting downwards. Are there any other forces acting on this person? None? Hmm. Okay, well, wait a minute. So, like, we can't just say, we can't just say centripetal force, because I did hear the word centripetal. Because remember, centripetal can be one force, or it can be multiple forces put together. So, the centripetal force is the actual force going into a circle. So, we do know that there is this mg force pointing down this way. So, that, in this case, gravity would be centripetal, because it's going in a circle. Okay? But, if that's not the only force then the other force added to it would also be centripetal as well. Okay? So let's see if we can add some numbers to this. The jet is trying to move in a maneuver that will create a vertical circle with a radius of 2.7 kilometers. So let's go ahead and write 2,700 meters. And if your jet's going fast enough, that's a pretty tight circle. Uh, the next thing is that the uh, jet is moving at a constant speed of 225 meters per second. So the jet is going to be going this way at 225 meters per second. Let's see if there's any other information that we need. I don't think they give us the mass of the jet at all. So let's see. Okay. It says, determine the force exerted by the seat on the pilot at the bottom of the loop and at the top of the loop. And express your answers in terms of the weight of the pilot, mg. So let's see what we got here. I think we're doing the top one first, right? Okay. If you're at the top... There is a force of gravity pulling you down, okay? What's just keeping this guy from just, like, going in a straight line path out this direction and just, like, falling? No? 
inertia is what's keeping him so like his inertia what is that that's the key what is changing his inertia gravity isn't really changing his inertia when you're in a car and you're driving in a circle and somebody like slams on the actual car like slams on the steering wheel and you fly and you hit the wall what stops you from flying out of the car the seat belt or the car depending if you're not wearing your seatbelt, the car is what stops you. If the car does not stop you, you continue going, okay? And that's generally what happens when people don't wear their seatbelts and they get into a collision is object in motion stays in motion and they eat out of the car. So if you're in an airplane and you're going in a circle, what is keeping you in the circle? The airplane is literally the thing that's keeping you in the circle. So that means that if you're being smushed against the airplane, is there a normal force acting here? Yes. Okay, what direction is the normal force at the top? Okay, so like, right? At this, at this point, yeah, at this point, you're like this, okay? So the seat's gonna be this way. There you go. So the normal force is actually gonna be pointing down in this case. Okay, so I'm gonna call this in top. This is the this is the normal force at the top of the at the top of the loop. Okay, so like normal force at the top. Okay, did you really? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes I do completely ignore whenever other people are just like completely lost, and I try to give some little bit more time to think. So even if you do say like the right answer, it doesn't automatically mean that I'm like instantly dismissing you. Sometimes we just need a little time to think about stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, if people aren't actually saying things, then they're probably behind. And they're probably like trying to process what's I don't, I don't, behind's not the right word. They're probably trying to process what's happening. Physics isn't exactly easy. So, and if you think it is, then something's wrong with you. It's crazy. All right, so normal force and mg. Uh, I don't think there's any other forces acting on this. I mean, there is the force of the engine and the drag, but let's just say that those just end up canceling out. I'm not really super uh, interested in those. These are the things that are actually keeping us in the circle. So when we write out our Newton's laws, because we know that it's moving. So is it moving? Yeah. Is it accelerating? Yeah, it is. Even though it's going at constant speed, we know that it's going in a circle. So there has to be a centripetal acceleration. So the sum of the forces is going to have to equal mv squared over r because it's going in a circle so we just need to add up those forces and see what those forces come out to be okay so let's see um we've got the normal force and we've got mv squared over r so let's go ahead and add these together what what forces do we have over on this side create what forces do we have over here This expands out. Like if this was a click menu, you could click it and it would expand. Do what? Yeah, we've got normal force, normal force at the top. Okay. Plus or minus? Is it wanting to keep it in the circle or is it wanting to go out of the circle? Okay. So, okay, so we're going to go plus. Um, what is that, mg is equal to mv squared over r? Ooh, did everybody, okay, so since everybody brings mass to the party, well, wait a minute, hang on now, hang on now. Assumption, yeah, hang on. The assumption that was just made there is that the assumption is that n is equal to mg. And I don't think that is the right assumption to go with this time because the normal force is actually being caused not by gravity, but, but by the actual airplane itself. So I don't think we can make this assumption. I don't think it works. So I don't think everybody brought mass to the party this time yet. Okay. So uh, they don't give it to us. They, 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 totally don't, they totally don't give it to us. So we're looking for the, I think, the force of the seat against the person. 
So we're looking for the force of the seat against the person. So we're looking at how much they actually push. So we're looking for into the top. We're looking for that normal force at the top. So can we solve for the normal force at the top? Okay, well, what would I do from here then? Okay. So I would put normal force at the top is equal to mv squared over r minus mg. Okay, so the normal at the top is going to be equal to, um, we can pull out the m if we wanted to, and I think that might actually be what we need to do. There are, um, yeah, we could just, we could. In fact, if we wanted to, we could actually take mg out the entire thing and pull it out to the side over here. So we could do this, um, m, and let's see if I've, I'm going to blow your mind or not, mg times m, oops, sorry, I just blew my own mind. I'm pulling out an m and a g, so it's going to be v squared over rg minus 1. Is that okay? Did I just hurt people? <laughs> any, 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 any aneurysms happening from that one? The main reason why I did that is because I, if I do it this way, I can actually answer what the normal force is in terms of like how many mgs we actually have acting on the system. So I can use it as kind of a ratio to give me a general idea of what that weight is going to feel like. And I know what V squared is, I know what R is, and I know what G is. So I can just plug in the numbers, and I can actually get an answer for it. So I can have mg out to the side, and this number in here would be 225 meters per second squared uh, divided by... 2,700 meters times 10 meters per second squared minus 1. And the, notice that the units actually work out too. You've got meters squared per second squared on top, and you've got meters squared per second squared on bottom. 0.875? Okay, so whenever we multiply all that together, are you sure everything was done correctly? I'm going to need a second on that 0.875. So this number, after multiplying it all together, theoretically, we have attained that it's 0.875, but I'm going to need a second. I'm going to need a second on that one. I'm going to need a second, Chief. Got to th take, a, take a moment to process it. Take a moment to process Uh, the whole thing is minus 1 whenever you're done. Yeah. So it's 225 squared divided by 2,700 times 10, or 27,000, and then subtract that. Do what? 7 eighths? OK. That is 0.875, yeah. Okay. Hmm. That's not what they're getting here in the answer. <laughs> Are you sure? Because they got 0.913. Maybe, but they're using 9.8 instead of 10, so that might make all the difference. That might make all the difference. Okay. So we just used 10 instead. And I told you guys that you could do that, so this is reasonable. So the normal force at the top is going to be equal to about 87% the weight of the person themselves. 
So whenever you're up at the top, the centripetal force is going to be, uh, it's going to make you feel lighter up at the top, okay? Because gravity, the centripetal force is going to be mostly this gravitational force and a little bit of this normal force. So you don't feel that push nearly as much happening at you. However, when you're at the bottom, that makes a little bit more of a difference. So let's calculate what it actually is going to look like at the bottom. And let's make a free body diagram for what it would actually look at at the bottom too. So if we pretended that the person is at the bottom, and just keep in mind, here's the loop-de-loop, -loop, like so. Okay, if we're down here, like at the very bottom of it, what would the free body diagram look like then? Okay, so you would have gravity pointing down this direction. And then we would have the normal force pointing up this direction. So normal force pointing up, and let's call this normal at the bottom. So I'll call it in bot. Okay, normal force at the bottom instead of normal force at the top. Okay, um, if we were to add them together in our sum of our forces, what would we get? It's not. Some of the forces, is it moving? So it's accelerating. Nope. Yes, it is, right? Yeah. So that means if it's accelerating, then this some of the forces is going to be equal to mass times acceleration, specifically circular acceleration. So it's mass times v squared over r, and v squared over r. Now, if I'm going to expand these out, this direction here, OK? This force expands. One of these is positive. One of these is negative. OK, last time you made them both positive. This time you got to pick. Y'all agree? Yes. Normal positive, gravity negative? Yes. OK. So in the bottom, it's going to be positive minus mg is equal to mv squared over r. We're looking for the n at the bottom again. So we can do the same trick, but as you noticed, it's really similar. There's just one small difference. How do you solve for the uh, normal force at the bottom? So if I'm wanting to solve for this. OK, we're going to add mg to both sides. So it's going to be mv squared over r plus mg. So this force makes you feel heavier. When you're at the bottom of the vertical circle, you're going to feel heavier because the normal force is going to be pushing with mv squared over r plus the force of gravity, mg, to keep you in that circle. Because, well, you're wanting to go down. Your, your gravitational force is wanting to go downhill. So we'll go ahead and finish this out. Normal force at the bottom is equal to uh, mv squared over r plus mg. And we can do the same trick. Uh, we can pull the mass out, and we can also pull the g out as well. So the normal force at the bottom would be equal to, I'm going to do the same thing, mg gets pulled out. On this side, it becomes v squared over rg plus 1. So if you remember what that v squared over rg is, you just have to add one to it. Now, instead of subtract one, Yeah, the last one was 1.91, or zero, what was it, 0 0.91. So if you, if you added one instead of subtracted one, it would be 2.91 mg. OK, so like if you add these together, that's going to be 1.91 plus 1 is 2.91. This is also assuming that you use um, 9.8 meters per second squared. For us, I think it would be 2.875 instead of 2.91, OK? But either way, if you use 9.8 or if you use 10, you know, in AP physics, you can use 10 and it's perfectly fine. No big deal. 
Okay, so this actually shows us that at the bottom of the vertical circle, you're going to appear heavier. Um, at the top of the circle, you're going to appear lighter. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Okay, so there's an example of a vertical at the top of the loop and then a vertical at the bottom of the loop. So the force is at the top and the force is at the bottom. Do you need, uh, would y'all like another one of these or move on to gravity? Y'all are ready for gravity? Okay, I'll move on then. Um, here we go. If you have, all right. So a little context first. We have assumed for a long time that if you have a force acting on a person or a cat or a whatever, that this force is always going to be equal to the mass times the gravity. If it was a person, it'd be mg. If it was a cat, it would be mg. If it was an apple or an orange or whatever, it would be mg, right? So... This works most of the time, most of the time. But the assumption is that we're all on level ground. So if you're on the earth and let's say that that's just like a continent and you're just standing here, this is okay. Yeah, this is Florida. This is, this is Florida. That would make this Florida man. So if we went up here a little bit higher, gravity becomes less. And if we go even higher, gravity becomes less. And if we keep it going higher, gravity becomes less. Okay. Now we like, we didn't really know that that was a thing. Like, I know that y'all know that that's a thing because y'all have been like through grade school and you know that like, as you got into space, your teachers will always tell you a very blatant falsehood that says there's no gravity in space. And that's completely and 100% false. There is gravity in space. It gets weaker as you go away. But if you went up into space, if see those four tick marks? If Florida man went up those four tick marks and went up into space and he did nothing else, he would just fall right back down. Okay. You can like, and, and I, like with my regular physics class, it like blows their mind because there was that, that Red Bull challenge where the dude like went up into space in a balloon and then he like jumped back down. Okay, he skydived from space, right? But like they were expecting whenever he went outside that he would just float there. But he was in space and he went outside and he went, time to go home. And he like stepped off and he just like fell, like legit fell. It wasn't like, I'm really light now. It's like Yeet Boy just like immediately falling. That's what it, it basically did that. Yeah, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> So it, gravity is still exists out in space. It's just weaker as you get further and further away from it, which means as we get further away from space, our analogy of F equals MG comes more into question. So down here, if I said MG, this would be fine. That's not a problem. But if I said MG up here, this actually is not a good accurate representation of what the actual force of the Earth on the person is, okay? At the bottom of the Earth, uh, when, when you're on the surface, okay, um, there are two Newton's third law pairs that happen here, okay? So um, I think I'll go ahead and I'll just start with that one. So the gravitational force is always a Newton's third law pair, okay? Gravitational force is always, 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 always a Newton's third law pair. Third law pair. No matter what, that is super, super, super important. Okay, the gravitational force is always a Newton's third law pair. There is a force on both. So if you are on the Earth, then that means that there are two forces acting here. Okay, the force that goes down is the gravitational force from you to the Earth. So in this case, this would be the force of A to B, 
And then on the Earth itself, there's a force that's pulling back, that's pulling you. Uh, let's see. Force B. Let me write my picture first before I go crazy. All right. On the first one, it's pointing down. The Earth is pulling you down with a force of gravity equal to your weight. Okay? That's okay. Y'all don't normally have a problem with that. You do have a problem whenever I say you pull back on the Earth with a force equal to your weight. So if I'm pulling down, or sorry, if the Earth is pulling me down at 700 newtons or whatever the heck weight I am, then that also means that I'm pulling back up on the Earth with a force of 700 newtons. Okay? It's a Newton's third law pair. So if there's 700 newtons of Earth gravity pulling it down, I also exert a gravitational force of 700 newtons up. It's a third law pair. Okay? You can't get away from it. It's a third law pair. You only feel one of them, though. Okay? You don't feel both forces. Right. You don't feel yourself. You don't. You don't feel the force. You don't feel the force that you exert on the Earth. You feel the force that the Earth exerts on you. So you only feel one of these forces. You don't feel both of them. Okay, does that make sense? Are we are we all okay? <laughs> are are we all okay so far? No existential crisis. Okay. All right. So the the person who who came up with this concept was Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton had moments, like there's a whole lot of stuff that Isaac Newton did throughout the course of his life. And you always get this classic story about Newton having an apple hit himself on the head, and then like he automatically, automatically was like, aha, gravity. And no, that's not really what ended up happening. He really thought about like the, the systematic process of what gravity is, and he would look at different planets and, and the different motions in the sky, and he would say that something has got to be holding those things together. Something's got to be keeping these things from like just flying out and an object in motion stays in motion, because that's that was his first law. So he was like, well, I made the <laughs> I made inertia. So uh, he didn't make it, but he he rationalized inertia. Yeah. He rationalized it. So he's like, well, okay, so if, if this is the way that things are, if an object in motion stays in motion, then something's got to be holding these things in place. And he said, well, okay, uh, the things that hold everything in place is the same thing that holds us down to the earth. And he was the first person that came up with this concept of universal gravitation. And this concept of universal gravitation means that the force of gravity, it, it's, it's basically a model that applies to all gravitational concepts, okay? So not only does it apply to people on Earth, but it also applies to bodies out in the middle of space. So, like, for example, if you take um, the Earth and the moon, so we're going to say Earth here, and we're going to just say moon. The moon is a satellite, okay? Um, so... The moon is like the name of our satellite that goes around us. Technically, Saturn and Jupiter and stuff like that, they have satellites. You can call them moons, though, and most people are okay with that. Uh, so these, there, there's an equal and opposite force to each other. And the Earth and the moon will exert this equal and opposite force on each other. So not only does the Earth pull on the moon, but the moon also pulls on the Earth with an equal amount. This number of the force, since these masses are really, really big, ends up being a really, really large number in order to actually get this stuff to, to work out. Okay? Now, here's what Isaac Newton said. He said that instead of thinking about the force of an object is equal to mg, there's a small problem here. Because if I'm talking about mg, that's not taking into account both masses. So the Earth, let's just call that big M, and the Moon, let's just call that little m. He said there's got to be some way that we could think about this some other way, some other direction. And here's what he came up with. He said that the force that is acting between two large celestial objects, or to any two objects in the universe, 
is going to be equal to uh, some constant, which we'll call big G, times the big mass times the little mass over the radius squared. GMM over R squared. Okay. So he said that if you take the force or if you take the two masses and find the product of the two masses and divide it by the square of the distance between them and multiply it by some constant. And he didn't really know what this constant was because he didn't have enough information to be able to or, or enough experimental evidence to be able to find out what that constant was. He could get close, but you know, he, he didn't really like exactly know what this number was. Fortunately for us, we know this number is available to us on our AP Physics 1 formula sheet. It is called the universal gravitational constant, which I will never use that word again. I will henceforth call it big G. Okay, so big G stands for the word that I won't say again. This one. Yeah, y'all can say it. That's fine. No, I'll say it again if y'all want me to. It's, it's called the universal gravitational constant. But most of the time, whenever you guys hear me say it in conversation, I won't say universal gravitational constant. I'll just say big G. So uh, big G times big M little m over R squared. Okay. Now, this number is actually super teeny tiny. Okay. Super teeny tiny. Does anybody see it on their formula sheet? Did y'all eat your formula sheets? She's like, oh, it's so tasty. Um, yeah, big G is equal to, we're going to, I'll go ahead and write that number down. Uh, if I don't, if y'all don't memorize it, I don't have to have it memorized. Good. That's really small. Uh, I don't know if y'all realize that, but that's, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. <laughs> That's a really, really small number. Okay, so it's much easier to write it in scientific notation than it is to actually write that out. It also has units that go along with it too. Uh, meter squared on top? Uh, Newton meter squared, yeah. Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. So look at it, the, the meters will cancel out because they're dividing by the radius squared on bottom and the kilogram squared will cancel out. So this constant will leave your answer in Newtons. Every single gravitation problem dealing with planets has to have this 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th in there. You can't get rid of it. It's just, it's there. You're not gonna be able to get rid of it. It, well, okay, like I cannot answer the question as to why it's so tiny, because if I tried to answer the question as to why it was so tiny, we would get into the fundamental laws of the universe and 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 the answer is we just don't know yet okay i can tell you what we do know we do know that there are when it comes down to it four fundamental forces in the universe and i think i've already gone over those gravity uh gravity electromagnetic uh, and the strong and weak nuclear force the, the bottom two are what holds neutrons and protons together and the electromagnetic is for like uh, positive and negative interactions. So electrons and protons that holds the atoms together. And then gravity is what holds the big things together. OK, the general idea, the general idea is that all four of these forces are actually all part of the same thing. But we don't know the actual mechanism by which that actually occurs yet. But a lot of people are kind of under the the um, from evidence seen by things that these four forces are actually very similar to each other. OK, as of right now, though, they're all separate out. OK, um, and gravity is one of those particularly pesky ones. It is the weakest of the four forces. So therefore, it, and it is tremendously weaker than the other ones. However, the range of gravity is infinite. Yeah, the range of gravity is, as far as we can tell, there is no particular range to it. Okay, the other ones do have a range. Like, like for example, if you take a magnet and you and you try to get close with a magnet, you don't feel an inverse R squared force on a magnet because gravity works like this. As you get further away from the object, and you have to get like way far away from the object, 
um, when you're close, there will be like a specific gravity value for when you're on the surface. And then as you get away from that planet or that really, really big object, you get a decreased force that goes down in a curve like this. So as you go away from it, you get like a inverse amount squared. It doesn't go down linearly. So like if you were a distance, let's just say that this is the surface right here. I'll, I'll skip the whole like going to the middle because really weird stuff happens whenever you go inside of a planet. Um, let's just assume that we start our graph at the surface of a planet. When you get to double the amount, so if you're going two times the radius, then the force that happens is going to be a quarter as much. So you get one fourth G. So if you're twice as far away, that's going to be two squared. You're literally dividing by two squared, which is dividing by four, which will give you a one fourth amount. If you get three radiuses away, then that's going to give you one ninth gravity. Okay, so it gets weaker, but you could probably still feel it. Okay, compare that to a magnet on the other hand, and I need to, uh, let me just get rid of this pin for a second. Um, this magnet is really strong, and if I try to get close to it, I don't feel an increased amount of force up until I get to about like right here. And this is where I actually start to actually feel the force and it starts to like put it in place. But it doesn't obey this same inverse R squared force that we see right here, okay? It actually, it, it's a much, much weirder graph to look at that. It, it's more like um, if you were to look at a magnet, it's more like, uh, it's more like, shoom, it just like goes straight down like that. Okay, it's not an inverse R squared force. Um, it is it, it is an inverse force, so it gets stronger as you get closer to it. I wouldn't, um, I don't, these are not really, um, I guess these are negative slopes. Yeah, these are negative slopes. Uh, I wouldn't call it a negative graph, but I would definitely call it a negative slope because it gets smaller as you continue to go down. Um, but but yeah, and then the nuclear, the strong and the weak nuclear force, I just that's way above our pay grade. So that's yeah, that's chemistry stuff. I don't I don't mess with that kind of stuff. Yeah, we'll we'll pre we'll pretend we'll pretend that I don't mess with that kind of stuff. Um, I did in college, but it's been a long time since then. Yeah, uh, I could definitely teach all chemistry, but that is not this class. Um, so these four forces. Of all of them, gravity is like the absolute weakest with that 10 to the negative 11th. If gravity were stronger, planets would smash into each other. So like a lot of people are like, well, can't we just make big G like, uh, first of all, we can't make big G anything. Like why, yeah, we have no control over this. Why, why gravity, the, why the universal gravitational constant is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th is just the way that things work. Like from a scientific perspective, I can offer you no explanation as to why G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. It's just that we notice things spinning around in the sky, and this is the value that we have come up to to be that value. Okay, science exists to explain things that we can see, um, but we can't see why that was this way because we're we're just humans in here. So hypothesize away, you know, just make sure that hypotheses have to be tested. Okay. Um, so sorry about the why part. Um, is everybody still okay? All right. Let's do an example. So let's say that we have two really big masses. Um, let's say that mass one has a mass of, hmm, how about you want to go big or really big? extremely big uh 3.7 times 10 to the 25th kilograms which is a pretty large number you put 25 zeros on the end of that and this other thing over here has a mass of i don't know 2.1 times 10 to the 18th kilograms so put 18 zeros on the other side of that okay and they're separated by a distance of why don't we say uh, 1.9 times 10 to the seventh meters. Now this is going to be the biggest factor. So like if you're looking at uh, like what makes the big deal in gravity, it's the distance between the two objects because 
yeah, you do have to multiply the two masses together, but you're also going to have to divide it by the distance squared. So the distance is what actually wins out here. So the bigger that distance is on the bottom, the, lar or the smaller your force is going to be in between the two objects. Okay, so... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, minus the sun. You said every planet, so it still, yeah, still counts. The sun is huge. Yeah, the sun is ginormous. All right. So here we go. And you can still see it on the night sky. Yeah. Um, let's calculate this. The force of gravity between these two objects is going to be equal to big G um, times... 3.7 times 10 to the 25th kilograms times 2.1 times 10 to the 18th kilograms uh, divided by 1.9 times 10 to the 7th quantity squared. Okay, and big G is, and remember this is all going to be out in front. This big G in front is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's out in front. Okay. At this point, like with other calculations, your cell phone was fine. With these really, really large numbers, I have yet to see somebody do a good job of using a cell phone with these. Can you do it? Yes. Is it like pulling teeth? Yeah. I, I wouldn't recommend it, to be honest. Okay. If these numbers are just like the exponential, the, the numbers are just too big. So, yeah, the EE button is your fan. Uh, let's see, time, oops, time, Okay. See if y'all get the same thing that I got. Calculate away. Let's see what we get. Okay. So we got a second? All right. 1.4. What is that? 4.4? Four, four? Yeah, 1.44 four times 10 to the 19th Newtons. Don't worry, if you round off here, you're only off by a couple hundred billion million. No big deal. Uh, but like in, in all honesty, since that's three significant figures, um, if you're talking about like, yeah, this is definitely like the definition of horseshoes and hand grenades here. So yeah, are, are you off by a bunch? Yes. Does it really matter with these large numbers? Not really. So yeah, so this one, uh, between the two objects, now 3.7 times 10 to the 25th is a really large object. Um, so the uh, the Earth is somewhere around 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So you're looking at something that is 10 times the mass of the Earth, which is pretty massive. Still not sun-sized, though, but but pretty good. Pretty decent chunk of, chunk of dirt there. Um, and that's going to give you a force of 1.44 times 10 to the 19th. If these things are not actually moving and they just like smash into each other, they will pull into each other and create a massive amount of friction and both of these objects will probably go boomies because 1.4 times 10 to the 19th is a really big number. Okay, that's a lot of force. Uh, the likes of which we have never seen as human beings and hopefully won't because if we do, that's not going to be good. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, asteroids are, are extinct level events to us, and this would be like five moons crashing into us. Yeah, it'd be crazy. Fun stuff, all right? I think that's it for today. We'll continue going with gravity tomorrow, and we'll actually start dealing with like things that spin because things have to stay in place, and we're going to figure out how they stay in place. <laughs>